Ted's watch is correct, mine is not. Just out of curiosity, how many of you in here know what the GDPR is? So how many of you know about it because you have to work with risk and compliance? Man, that's awfully exciting for risk and compliance people. <laughs> that was pretty risque, really. Like, wow, I raised my hand and said, woo, I have to report that on a form. Uh, <laughs> fuck yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. So I am uh, uh, by trade now a CISO, <laughs> and uh, so I have to care I have to com care about risk and compliance all the time, which is really exciting. Um, I sold a little bit of my soul to do that. Um, are we streaming or are we still waiting? We're live. Oh, okay. There's no, there's no signal. It's more of an ethereal, like, how does the room feel? It feels like we're streaming now. Okay. So um, in my role of CISO, um, I got to care what GDPR is. And uh, I went a little grayer in the process. So um, I'm cautiously optimistic that uh, Thomas can help us navigate the waters because honestly, for every person I talk to, I get different answers to my questions. So we'll see, <laughs> see what, what answers we hear from you. So anyway, uh, without further ado, uh, here's Thomas Fisher to in instruct us on GDPR. Thanks, Thomas. So, thanks. So the, the one thing, I, thanks everyone for having me. It's, it's really great to be here. Um, I just want to say one thing. It's like every time I seem to come to the US, during winter, the government's about to shut down. So I think I have to stop coming to the US in the winter. <laughs> so anyway, um, yes, compliance, and the pro this is one of the problems I have, and this is one of the reasons I did, I've built this talk, is that GD the GDPR is actually a lot more than just compliance. So, so my name's Thomas, I do a lot of things, but basically I work in data protection. I also spent a number of time, tire, tire, God, number of years in IR teams, and I run B-Sides London. You're welcome to come if, you, if you're in London during June. I am not a lawyer, right? So anything I say here is picked up from discussions I've had with customers, in meetings I've had on the GDPR, in community meetings where we, we've talked. You need to validate everything that I say with your, if you're working on this with your legal uh, counsels in-house. In the thing is, you'll get so many different variations, and Bruce just said it, you know, he's, he's had so many different answers. And we won't get the truth until it actually escalates to this. So this is the equivalent of your Supreme Court in the US. Um, until it escalates to there, we actually won't know what the law actually, how the law is going to be interpreted and what's actually gonna happen in terms of data protection under the GDPR. But to be fair, all existing recommendations are based on existing case law that's from the local, uh, what we call data protection authorities and how they've handled the previous reg uh, legislation. The good thing is, is that in Europe, we have this thing called the Working Party 29, which was mandated by the parliament, which basically interprets the law. So they are actually writing papers on what some of the key aspects of the, of the GDPR is. So it's, that's a really good thing. So for those of you who don't know what the GDPR is, the GDPR is a regulation and essentially, it's about protecting an, the fundamental rights of a natural per EU citizen. And part of that right is the processing of personal data. The EU realized that you know, as we're moving forwards, processing personal data in, in the, over, over the internet, in applications and things like that has become a business critical function. So they don't want to hamper that. Um, so I like to do Q&A in this because, well, some of the people know what it, this is. So in, in this slide is actually one false statement, right? So the regulation from the EU Parliament, I mean, it, w it was voted, it, a lot of people would say, oh, it's so short, we have so little time. If you saw the, at the beginning those numbers on the first slide, we're actually, it's actually a countdown clock, there's about 125 days left until this comes into effect. And the thing is, a lot of people um, don't realize that this was actually voted two years ago. Right? So there's been two years to prepare. So in this statement, there's actually one false thing. Does anybody know who it, what it is? What? B or E? E, exactly. So there is a big difference between a, um, the previous law, with the previous Data Protection Act, what's called, a, uh, what's called a directive. In the EU law, a directive basically says, 
this is what we think you should be doing, each member nation. Now you have to apply it. It would be like as, as if your federal government basically told the states, this is the framework of your law that you have to implement in, the, in, the, in, in your local states. Do it your own way. So that led to a lot of problems because different aspects of things were going on across different, different member states. So we never had proper data protection in some countries. So essentially, the regulation, the difference with the regulation is that the, that is law across all EU member states, including, including the UK until May next year, when they'll have their own set of laws. That said, the GDPR brings in some key fundamental points, and nine, the, these are the nine key fundamental things that you need to capture from the DG, GDPR. The larger fines, everybody's heard about the larger fines. But people, what people tend to forget is that we have the new rights, right? So the, and the fair processing notice, consent. Everybody's talking about the consent aspect. Yes, there's an international dynamic shift. So, we, so in the GDPR, it takes into account that data is processed across nations and that other com companies are, more, are global so that you might have European data here in, in, in this. I mean, like the Hilton here, they have my data, so they're potentially affected by the GDPR. They bring in a concept of data protection officers. Now, I know you guys like to call it a data privacy officer in the US. The thing is, a data privacy officer is actually quite different than a data protection officer, be mostly because a, pri uh, a privacy officer is about, um, really, it's, it's privacy has a different connotation than protection. Mandatory breach reporting, everybody's heard about that, 72 hours. And one key aspect that people people don't really talk about, and it's not really compliance, is privacy by design. There is fundamental aspects of the articles in the GDPR which forces you to actually think about how you're processing and how you're protecting and how you're building applications that manage more personal data. So in the penalties space, so this is another question one, there's only, there's only one, one, one of these is right. Does anybody know which one it is? Bottom. Correct, the bottom one. So uh, it applies to data controls and processes. In terms of administrative penalties and administrative actions that the, the data protection authority can take, there's fines, but there's also aspects of they can require you to stop processing, and they can, you can be refined if you don't do what you're, what you're asked to do or if you, if you continue to, to violate some of the articles. The fact of the matter is, and you've probably heard this, is that the fines are astronomical, right? So 10 million or 2% worldwide annual turnover, 20 million or 4%. So why the two numbers? Well, there's a fundamental difference between the two numbers, right? Most data breaches will be in the first category because the first category talks about simple personal data. The second category, the 20 million one, actually talks about what we call sensitive data. And I'll get, that, I'll get that to that in a bit. But there's, there's something else in that statement is administrative fines should be effective, proportionate, and dissuasive, right? So if you're talking about hitting something like maybe JP Morgan, they're probably going to go for the maximum fine. If you're talking about hitting a small business, they're probably going to go, eh, okay, no, no problem. We'll give you a time to fix things. We'll give you and we'll proportionate, we'll make a proportionate decision against you. I know there are companies in the US, and I'm sure you can think of which ones. If you want, I can, I'll, I'll name them privately. But they're already preparing legal teams to actually for May 27th, right? Because they know they're going to get DPA requests. So breach notifications. So you have 72 hours to report to DPA. This key requirement in data breaches. There's some other key requirements. So in this, there's one statement that's true. Anybody? No. It's D. Include notifications to data subjects. So you have to, if you if you if there is a breach, you need to actually report it to the data subject as well. But it's 72 hours from the moment you become aware of the breach. So if, essentially, that means that you need to think about how am I going to rejigger my incident response process so that I know what I need to report to the, uh, the Data Protection Authority. A lot of people think breach is loss of data, you know, like exfiltration. Under the GDPR, 
and privacy by design and security of processing, which are two of the articles, it's everything from destruction, loss, alteration, unauthor unauthorized disclosure, or ac unauthorized access to the, that personal data, right? That means that you need to be able to monitor if a malicious user or a malicious third party actually changes the data. How many of, how many of you who are working in, GD, in the GDPR actually have actually thought about that? Or actually taken, thinking, how am I going to detect that, right? This is where compliance falls down because you can make a checklist as much as you want to say, oh, I'm doing this, this, and that. But at the end of the day, it's a continuous process of monitoring what you're actually looking at. See, um, so you don't need to report every breach. However, the wording is, unless unlikely to result in the risk to rights and freedoms of persons. They don't define risks and freedoms, right? And uh, rights and freedoms. So if, I, if they steal my credit card, is that a breach of my right and my freedom? Could that affect me malicious uh, in a bad way? Yeah, potentially. So you have to report that kind of thing. So one of the things, aspects I've seen is that most people are just going to, if they think they've, they've gotten to that state, they're just going to report it just to avoid being in a situation where they haven't reported so the, that the penalties and the fines start, start to be potentially go into effect. So the GDPR also defines key players and key functions and the accountability. So me down in the bottom left, I'm called the data subject in the, in the GDPR. So I'm the person. It's my data. It belongs to me. It doesn't belong to you as a company who's processing it or collecting it. So I have the right to call the DPA and ask for information to, for the DPA to take action against a controller. A data controller is the company that essentially collects the data so the, the company in, fa in front of you. So think people like Twitter, Facebook, Hilton, anybody who's collecting personal data and asking for personal data. You have then have what we call the processor. The processor can be the controller as well, but a data processor can also be a third party. So, you know, a lot of us now use AWS for back-end applications, things like that. AWS is considered a processor. And they've done a lot of work on the GDPR. They're actually, I think it's in May, I'm not sure if there's anybody from Amazon who knows this, but can confirm, but I think in May they're going to require anybody who does business or works with the EU to actually amend their contracts with a specific GDPR clause, their AWS contracts. So the... Interactions between the controller and the processor is that you have to set up a specific um, contract between those that, that carries forward the aspects of data usage and the way that you're using the data, part of the access to the data subject rights, and I'll get into that in a bit. Then they, are, they have to report to the DPA. So any types of processing or any types of incidents, they have to report to the DPA. And you can nominate data protection officers. So those have to be in the controller or the processor. So you have those data processors. So the data protection officer or DPO, so is this statement true or false? Controllers or processors are always required to point a DPO. So how many of you think that you need a DPO, whatever situation you're in, if you're collecting personal data from the EU? So, dumbfound, huh? <laughs> so actually you don't need a DPO necessarily. So the, the, the regulation says that it's under certain situations. One of them is if you're a public authority. So public authority essentially is a government agency. If you do regular monitoring. So for example, if you, so, um, yeah, I don't know if you guys, so maybe, you know, if you have a transit system and that transit system has an RFID card or is linked to your bank account, that's potentially personal data. So, for example, in the UK, we have the tr Transport for London. So I have this, you know, they, you can use your phone, you can use your credit card, your, your RFID credit card, or you have a, an RFID badge that you can use to, to actually log in and take the tube. The problem is, is that they're continuously monitoring patterns of usage of people. So they're actually doing big data and analytics on the movements of people and to, to determine peak, peak times and determine in flow and things like that. So that's regular monitoring. Large amounts of sensitive data. So sensitive data is a very specific category of data in, under the GDPR, and I'll get to that in a sec. 
So what is personal data? Well, it's actually defined in Article 4.1. So that's about the only article I'll give you this, this afternoon. It's any information relating to the ability to identify or a, a natural person. So a natural person is a data subject, you, me, anybody, directly or indirectly. The key aspect here is indirectly. Directly, it's easy. You have a name, you have a date of birth, etc. Indirectly is more complicated. You could use username plus an IMEI. That will allow you to indirectly identify a person. So some of the FAQs and things like that start to name things. So you've got personal data and unique identifiers, health records, IPs, IMEIs. They're actually specifically called out in the GDPR. So an IP address is a personal uh, personal identifiable object. And the IM, do you, do you guys know what IMEI is? Okay. So for those who, just to make clear, for those who don't, it's the mobile phone number, it's the mobile mobile identity. So you've also got, it also defines genetic and biometric data, some things, and there's some more um, specific things called sensitive data, criminal records, and, and a few others. So uh, a colleague and I uh, sat down an afternoon and decided, let's figure out in terms of you know, application data. So what individual objects would we need to be able to identify a person, either one single object or multiple objects together? We came up with this horrendous list. It's horrendous, okay? I'm not going to read it all out. The, the key one that you want to look at is this middle one, right? Con the specific sensitive information. So under the GDPR, there's a category of information, all of those that are listed in that column, that you cannot process without pre-authorization from a data protection authority, right? People don't realize it, but the, the GDPR actually says that you should not be holding this data unless you've actually, there's a very good reason for it, and you've actually validated it with the DPA beforehand. But notice also at the bottom down here, so you've got GPS coordinates. So, yeah, I mean, earlier during the rant, he was talking about GPS coordinates, wasn't he? Social networks, email just CCTV footage. It contains personal information. And the thing is, it's not just, when you're actually thinking about how am I going to handle this personal data, it's not just one of those individual items. You have to think about being able to identify a person. So in some cases, you might actually need more than one. Then we get to the key data subject rights, which is the fundamental part, is that I've been given rights as an EU citizen to manage my personal data. And most people f focus on the consent and the right to be forgotten. However, there's a lot more rights, and nobody seems to be talking about them, and, no and I don't know how many people are actually taking them into account, because you need to do things with these things. You need to be able to respond to the subject, so there's the right to access. I'm allowed to call you and say, show me all the personal data that you're collecting on me and how you're using it. Data portability, that's insurance companies. I can go to my insurance company and say, well, I'm sick and tired of you. Give me my data. I'm taking it to another, to, another, to another provider. So you need to be able to give me that data. In a common, I mean, common use of machine, what the fuck does that mean? Excuse my language. But, I mean, if I give you machine-readable data, you're going to take it to another provider. It doesn't mean he can read the data. Plus, the fact that I'm giving you that machine-readable that data, is, is it a violation of the other articles of the GDPR? Because I've just given you data and it's been taken out of my systems and you're, it's, well, okay, you are giving it to you, the owner of the data, but if you accidentally lose it, who's responsible, me or you? It's so, you know, it, it's just insane. But it's, it's just not that. There's another few. There's the right to rectification. I can call you and say, hey, there's a mistake in my name. Correct it, please. The right to restriction of processing. I can call you and say, stop processing my data. The right to object. So if you change what you're doing with my data, I can call you and say, no, nah, you're not allowed to have my data. Give, you know, get rid of it. Consent. I have heard so much crap about consent. I was in a discussion one evening where the people were like, so I'm in a meet business meeting. I'm giving you my business card. I'm taking your business card. Do I need to tell you what I'm going to do with that business card? It's like, who are you kidding? Right? Sorry, backwards. So... This is where it gets confusing. People say you need to ask for consent for every piece of data, including like if you're creating an AD account, it's going to be shipped to the US or you, for HR. You don't. There's a thing called lawfulness of processing in the GDPR that says if you, you can collect personal data for contractual reasons, like employment 
contract. For legal obligations, because you have to, because you're under some other law like uh, fraud or abuse. Vital interest, so if something, you can collect data because, for example, you know, there's going to be, the, for, for weather, if there's going to be a weather incident, like the temperature is going to drop, so I need to know all the old people that might be affected. Public interest, so things like monitoring and, and collecting personal data for potential terrorists, and legitimate use. Legitimate use is an interesting one, because legitimate use can say that if I collect your personal data and I use it in an environment, I can actually basically um, use it across other applications if, I need, if it's legitimate, for a legitimate reason. I love forget me, the right to be forgotten. The problem with the right to be forgotten is that a lot of people think I have to do it. You don't have to do it. If you are bound by things like fraud law and things like that, you don't have to do it. It's also when technically feasible that you have to do it. The problem is if you're thinking about if I have to forget, what about big data databases? How do I do that? What about off-site backups? How the hell do I get rid of the personal data and off-site backup? I had a discussion with one person who said, well, let's encrypt the data. We'll get rid of the key. Yeah, but are you sure that your encryption method is safe? Number two, and what are you going to do? Create a, key, create a key management system that's going to create a key for every piece of personal data that you capture? And then figure out how, but then you have to associate that key to the personal data. So how the hell are you going to get rid of all this? Uh, never mind. <laughs> Access and portability. How many of you have applications where you can actually extract one piece of data? I know I'm at 20 minutes. <laughs> but oh, the problem with all these is that I'm going to leave you with this number. You have 40 days to respond to these data subject rights, right? I'm going to skip these articles, Privacy by Design and Protection Bank Pact Assessment, because it's a whole load of, well, it's risk assessment. Eh. But one of the key things is, what I came up with is that, if, in fact, if you take a think, think about all those data subject rights, what do I do and how can I improve my IT information security or my IT, you know, my IT systems and things like that? Well, if you do application reviews and if you've got SDLC, one of the things is to make sure that you have clauses of like opt-in, you do machine human-readable consent forms, you make sure the right data is collected, the, only the necessary data is collected. Oh, and guys, don't forget your logs. I've seen applications that log when they're in debug mode that actually print out all the personal data. So that piece of log just now becomes you know, actionable under the GDPR. One of the only real technical outside of encryption in the GDPR is pseudo-anonymization. Pseudo-anonymization is great. It's not anonymization. It's basically, if you can take the data and completely change it so it's no longer recognizable but, and no longer reassociable to a person, you can actually use that data in a safe manner and you get less, you get less penalties. So what happens if you do get a breach? And by breach, I mean any of the things that could potentially happen to a personal data. Well, you need to have a good remediation and IR response plan in place. You need to get all of this information to the DPA. And one of the important things is I was looking at the IR process, and if you break it down, I'm sorry, I'm rushing a bit because we're running out of time. We've run out of time. But the aspect of the 72 hours is you need to be able to notify people, the DPA and human if you've actually think there's a data, you know, you've, there's a breach. You don't have to give all the data. You just have to say, oh, I've got data. So in the IR process, I was like, how the hell am I going to detect if somebody has taken data or has destroyed data? Well, you need to know where the data is. And you know what? You need to learn regex. And there's some really interesting regexes to come. I'm actually trying to build some, but I haven't had time to work on it. Uh, I'm going to publish it on GitHub. And so that was it. I'm good. Two minutes over, sorry. But compliance, I really hate compliance. And just to leave you, how the hell do you get the, how the hell do you regex this? So questions? Okay, questions outside up front. Okay.